Take me to the mountains, for that's where I belong. Just birds and trees and wind and leaves and silence as my song. Beth Wren Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Coffee, Tea, and Crime. This is Dana, and in today's episode, JR and I will be hiking in Colorado as we look into a brutal kidnapping for money that turned deadly. This is the story of Golden Murder, the kidnapping and murder of Adolf Coors III. It was 7.55 a.m. on February 9th, 1960, as Adolf Ad Coors III wearing his lucky tan baseball cap and his favorite navy blue nylon jacket, made his daily 12-mile trek to the Coors Brewing Company in Golden, Colorado. He was the chairman of the board and CEO of the Adolph Coors Company and firstborn grandson of the brewery's founder, a husband and father of four. He normally had only a mile or so to travel from his home to U.S. Highway 285, but for the last month, a section of the highway had been closed for construction. The closure had forced him to navigate along a stretch of road comprised of dirt and gravel for about four miles to Turkey Creek Canyon, where a secondary road would take him to Highway 285. Coors eased the travel all along Turkey Creek Road as it dropped away into the canyon. The long, downward straightaway was punctuated by a fairly sharp right-hand curve about 60 feet or so from the Turkey Creek Bridge. A dilapidated one-lane wooden structure that allowed passage over the aptly named Turkey Creek. The bridge and creek wiped out or covered over in later years by highway construction. Coming out of the curve, Coors saw a car stopped on the bridge and a lone figure silhouetted by the morning sunlight. Thinking the driver needed assistance pushing his disabled vehicle off the bridge, Coors came to a stop a few feet from the big yellow 1951 Mercury sedan. He stepped out, closing his door, as he approached the man wearing a fedora and knee-length wool coat. Coors may have noticed the man wore spectacles just as he did. In fact, the man was very similar in build as well. Coors walked towards the yellow car, his footsteps echoing off the frail wooden bridge. The solitary figure suddenly stepped towards him, pulling a pistol and ordering Coors to come along quietly. The former semi-pro baseball player lunged at the man and the two began to struggle on the bridge, fighting for possession of the gun, their grunts and curses lost in the crisp morning air. During the violent struggle, both men lost their hats over the railing of the bridge and Coors' eyeglasses were knocked off his face and lay broken near the attacker's car. Coors suddenly disengaged from his attacker and tried to get away, running along the bridge, either trying to get back to his car or simply escape the area on foot. The would-be kidnapper panicked at the sight of his meal ticket escaping and without thinking, snapped off two rounds, which struck Coors in the upper right back. Coors died before the man could finish loading the body into the back seat of the Mercury. As Corbett drove south, he glanced back at the still form of Coors lying partially on the back seat and floorboard, the glittering reflection of the sun flashing off the unused handcuffs and leg irons near the still form. All Corbett's thoughts ran from how he had wasted years of planning for this one job to his escape plan now that things had gone awry. The convicted murderer had come to Denver in 1955, working at a paint plant under the alias Walter Osborne. He'd ordered a pistol, handcuffs, and leg irons via the mail over the coming years. He bought the Big Mercury just a month before the kidnapping and was ticketed while conducting surveillance on Coors just two weeks prior. The Fulbright scholarship recipient and escaped convict knew he had to get rid of the body and get out of town. Toronto. Within an hour of Corbett driving off from the bridge, the local milkman pulled up to the bridge and saw a green and white travel all parked at the Turkey Creek Bridge. He honked his horn and after seeing no one in or around the car, he got out and walked up to the vehicle. The engine was running and the radio was on. He saw a small patch of blood on the bridge and a hat sitting on the bank of the creek near the bridge. 
He walked back to his milk truck and beeped the horn again. Still, no one appeared, so he moved the International off the bridge and continued his milk route. He borrowed the phone at the first house he came to and called police. It wasn't long before the police and the two Coors brothers, William and Joe, were on the bridge. Soon, volunteers in cars, trucks, jeeps, and on horseback were checking the area. On February 10th, the day after the botched kidnapping, Corbett moved out of his apartment on Pearl Street in Denver. He turned his big Mercury towards the east. His only thought was to put as much space as possible between himself and the entire state of Colorado. The same day, Mary Coors received a ransom note telling her it would cost $500,000 to get her husband back and to place an ad for a tractor in the Denver Post classified section once she was ready to pay. The Coors family called J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, personally for help. He sent a legion of agents to Denver to help in the investigation. Local police had found a blood smear in the driver's seat of the travel all and a larger one on the bridge, indicating that Coors had been injured before climbing into his vehicle after an altercation on the bridge. Footprints and scuff marks showed the location of the struggle, along with Coors' broken eyeglasses. The brown fedora found on the bank obviously belonged to the suspect, and the tan baseball-style cap was identified by the brothers as being Adolph's hat. A canvas for witnesses in the surrounding area by police and federal agents proved highly successful as several people recounted a big yellow four-door Mercury cruising the area for the past month or so. A partial tag of AT62 was remembered by one man. There were four Mercuries in the Denver area with that letter and number sequence. Police quickly zeroed in on one registered to Walter Osborne. It was not lost on some that the name was also that of an Irish Impressionist and post-Impressionism landscape and portrait painter. Just the sort of humor a Fulbright scholarship winner might have wanted to interject into their crime caper. The police checked the now empty apartment 309 registered under the name Osborne. In the dumpster out back, police recovered empty boxes for handcuffs and leg irons. Inside the apartment, prints were lifted and were eventually matched to Corbett. Authorities now knew who their primary suspect was. On February 14th, following the kidnapper's demands, the Coors family placed the newspaper ad offering a John Deere tractor for sale. Three days later, Corbett's yellow 1951 Mercury was discovered ablaze near Atlantic City, New Jersey. By the end of March, Coors had still not been found and the FBI placed Corbett on its 10 most wanted list. The FBI and police departments all over the country were searching for Corbett, while local police continued to look for the body of Coors. The hope that he was still alive dropped precipitously each day that went by. Almost seven months to the day of his disappearance, September 11, 1960, the clothing and bones of Adolf Coors III were discovered in Douglas County at a private dump site along Jackson Creek Road and scattered down to South Garber Creek, a few miles west of Sedalia, Colorado. Experts conclude he had been shot twice in the back. By October 25, 1960, FBI agents had picked up Corbett's trail, which led to Toronto, Canada, where he again used the name Walter Osborne. Four days later, he was arrested in Vancouver, British Columbia and extradited back to Colorado. On March 13, 1961, Corbett's murder trial opened in Golden, Colorado, and in less than three weeks, he was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. In June of 1978, Corbett is released on parole. Due to a wave of public protests, Corbett's parole is revoked in less than a month and he is returned to prison. He is released on parole again the next year, violated his parole, went back to prison again, but finally in 1980 he is released once again. On August 24, 2009, Corbett, suffering from cancer, committed suicide. It was fitting he died by shooting himself. Well, as JR loves to quote from one of his favorite movies, I got the motive, which is money and the body, 
which is dead. And that'll do it for another episode of Coffee, Tea, and Crime. Let us know what you think about this case in the comments below. And if you have a suggestion for a specific case you'd like us to cover in a future episode, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so, so much for watching and give us a like if you enjoyed this video by hitting that thumbs up button. And don't be shy either. Go on and hit that subscribe button while you're there. Stay safe out there and JR and I will see you on the next case.